Welcome back. This is Not Aliens. This is Jared. We are on again, and I'm so grateful to be with Teresa and Daniel Duke. These are the great, great, great relatives of Jesse James, and more importantly, of a couple of great uh, research projects that have turned into lifelong pursuits, multi-generational pursuits that have turned into a couple books, both of which, as I introduce you, uh, Teresa, I'm going to let you lead with the first book, which we've already talked about. And Daniel, if you'd like to talk about the second book, at least from a basic intro, because I think that a lot of the people who follow my channel, they already, I know they've already watched your first videos and I know okay. they've entertained us on conflict, but Teresa, do you want to start with the first book for just a short overview? Yeah. Um, so we'll be discussing uh, the book that I co-authored with my brother, Dan Duke. Um, it's The Mysterious Life and Death of Jesse James. Um, it's, it's basically just um, a compilation of uh, evidence, newspaper articles, um, his journal. Um, and it's just showing, uh, we did like 20 years of research to prove that Jesse James didn't die as history states. Um, in 1882, and he lived on to be a really old man and died in Texas um, under the alias of James L. Courtney. Um, but yeah, it was a really interesting experience um, that, you know, took a lot of research, um, but we got it finished and it was a great experience. Yeah, and we've definitely, it's so fun to like be able to go a little more in depth on it. We have a bunch of photos we're going to go over with everyone. But this work, it's, I think it's important because the complexities of our past, you know, I was a kid who grew up in the whole idea of Jesse James and the James gang and all that, just the Wild West, everything that kind of gets thrown in there. And then for another layer down, people consider the Civil War and they they do think more about what led up to the wild west what led up and not that it wasn't wild before the 1860s but the idea of this post uh civil war uh it's so weird we always think of it as this manifest destiny thing but this really post apocalyptic uh nightmare where brother versus brother has annihilated each other and then you have roaming gangs of now professional military men and all that's fascinating but it's interesting because the complexity of this story ties into Templar treasures, which brings us uh, to your brother and right. uh, what, what after a lifelong pursuit in multi-generational stories uh, comes Templar treasures. And how does that fit in? Oh, that, that, yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember where to start. I mean, there's so much, when our mother started the story, you know, the research with Jesse James and while we would help her, um, when I had breaks, I would look into the treasure legends and there, there's a lot of any outlaw in the old West has got treasure legends around them. Sam Bass and just about you name it. They've got a legend of some kind of buried treasure. Um, but a lot of people kept stressing that Jesse was part of a secret society called the Knights of the golden circle and that the Knights of the Golden Circle after the Civil War had buried treasures. And the Knights of the Golden Circle, just to give you a little background, they, had, they were a, a secret Confederate, kind of a branch of the, the Confederacy. They were a secret organization who helped the Confederates. And their, their basic mission during the Civil War was to harass Union troops and slow their movements. But after the Civil War, they allegedly changed their goal to gaining as much money as they could any way they could so they could refund a second civil war. And you know, I thought I had no reason to doubt that, you know, of course, that's like kind of like a Texas football. If, if a team loses, they always want another shot at, at you know, they want another shot at the, the title. So they're, they, yeah. you know, anybody wants, wants a rematch. So uh, I thought, okay, I don't doubt that. And I got to researching it deeper, and and uh, the template. You, I don't, I don't, I don't know if everybody can see the template on the photo right now. 
on the screen? Uh, yeah. So it's it. We are in sh that share mode. So it's okay. gonna stay. Just for everyone listening, yeah, we're gonna go over these photos like we stated. But so we're we're combining this. Yeah, you've heard us talking before from our prior episode, but this is our chance to dig a little deeper and look at some of the specifics. And that's why we're sharing these photos and we're going to go through them. So whatever you want to lead with, we'll, we'll cover that and jump around okay. and yeah, the, yeah, uh, go for it. The template, uh, the, the photo you see on the screen is, uh, is what they called a lot of treasure hunters called it the Knights of the golden circle treasure template. And the problem with that, I had the template. Uh, we had, a map that had been passed down through the family by, you know, from Jesse through the family ended up in our, our mother's hands. Yeah. And we wanted, to, you know, we only, we couldn't figure out where the treasure was. There was no topographic, there, there were no topographic marks like, you know, 40 paces from the, the old oak tree, you know, X marks the spot kind of thing. The map was more just geometric designs and coded messages. And the codes were easy enough to break. It was, you know, so much in gold, so much in silver. And he even buried some greenbacks in a location. What he called greenbacks, just, you know, paper money. But uh, the uh, treasure template, I, I thought, okay, if I know a location of one treasure, I, 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 you would need, you know, I, it, I may have a starting point, but I would need at least, in my opinion, three, three locations so that I could get the scale of the template because there's no dimensions, no scale, nothing came with it, just that photo. And uh, there's several versions of it floating around the internet, but that's the basic Knights of the Golden Circle template. And so, you know, over it took years trying to find treasure locations and stuff. And then one day, uh, well, two different elderly gentlemen contacted us. One was George Roaming, who grew up when he was a child, Jesse was in his late eighties, early nineties, Jesse swore George to an oath. George was between the age of 10 and 12. And according to George, he was sworn to an oath of secrecy and hired to help Jesse move 700 bars of gold. And he drew a map out for my mother and I as you know, where exactly where they buried this gold. And so we, we found the location, but it's under a, it's, it's on, Fort Hood military reservation. So there was no way we could gain access to that, but at least I had a location as to, you know, where uh, just another treasure location. And after talking to George, another elderly gentleman contacted us. It was a uh, Wagner Carr. He was a former attorney general for the state of Texas. And um, he, he was interested in Jesse and the treasures. And he had his driver, he sent his driver out to pick my mother and I up and show us where, where several locations of, of large treasures were found and, and recovered. And so after he showed us, after the driver showed us the locations, I had all, this, all the points I needed. So I got home, got on the map, the, laid the template over Google Earth, made a transparency of it, laid it over Google Earth, and everything, it just, everything just started popping. And um, I knew exactly where the, the, everything fit, the treasure locations that I knew of and suspected locations from, from other legends. And then I thought, well, what happens if we, if we just lay it over in each direction, you know, just flip it over and it makes a, like a grid pattern, which is a, it's, I, I call the veil template now, but, um, at, before anyway it, it makes a grid pattern and it lines up with if you cover and i covered it spent it took a lot of time but i covered the u.s with this template the grid pattern and it it lines up with places like the los lunas decalogue stone in new mexico the mexico. newport tower in rhode island uh scott walter's hooked x in kensington uh, minnesota it's Minnesota, correct? Yeah, it's uh, Alex. Yeah. Well, it's I think it's Al, I know they call it the Kensington Ruin Stone, but where I would say that it's likely the um, it's near it, the the museum's in Alexandria, but okay. I actually don't know if it's actually if it's a township or if it's just part of Alexandria now. Okay. Uh, and I'm a Minnesotan, so hey, and I've been there, so I can't tell you more than that, other than. <laughs> go to alexandria 
And okay. everyone kind of grows up with it. We used to go to cabins there for, um, there's a lot of lakes in Minnesota. There's definitely, Alexandria is literally, there's Lake Alexandria. And the Viking Museum is right there in town. And, you know, there oh, it is. Cool. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's, it's something that we all really enjoy around here. But we also have Babe the Big Blue Ox and Paul Bunyan. So, hey. yeah. which makes and no giant sense. pancakes. I remember that story. It yep. always reminded me of the giant, giant pancakes. pancakes. <laughs> <So>. Yeah, <laughs> yep. and, and makes me hungry. It, yeah, and sorry. So, yeah, look, one thing I, I don't want to lose our train of thought on this, but for people who have never actually seen a treasure map, uh, this is. Uh, I think one of the questions would be, where did, where do you know that the map came from? That's a good question, and with that one. I don't know who 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 put that out on the internet. I don't know who put it out. A lot of people claim it ties back to to a man who claimed to be Jesse, and he was debunked as being Jesse uh, very thoroughly. His name was J. Frank Dalton. He also lived in Texas and claimed to have lived over a hundred years old. Uh, he also claims to have been a U.S. senator and a lot of other people. But for a while, he claimed to be Jesse James. Some people still believe that, and uh, he, the template came from him, but the backstory on that, after our great-great-grandfather passed away at the age of 97, uh, J. Frank Dalton was in Marble Falls. He, he's, he found a, a hotel, Marble Falls, Texas. He found a hotel right across the street from where Jesse's daughter, my great-grandmother, lived, and she had a lot of maps and papers and things. And I don't know how uh, we believe somehow some of the, her, cause some of her papers and maps and other objects went missing. And then later on he comes out claiming he's Jesse James and this pops up. Uh, I don't, I don't know if he took it or if one of her children sold it to, to him because they, maybe they wanted some money. I, I don't know how he got it, but he ended up with the template. Uh, I don't know if he got it from Jesse or if he got it from another source. It's, that's a mystery on that part of it. So you get the idea eventually the Kensington ruined stone, the Rhode Island, the tower, uh, there, there are pieces that are lining up and is there an equal distance to all of it or is it all random? Like it, or does it really fit within the, a larger scale? Does this map just translate to a larger scale and all these points match? Yeah, it, it, it the everything is an equal distance you know each each dot like the um oh the outer circle the inner circle it depends on the size template because there's three templates i found there's a large medium and small and say for example in in the um oh, if you count like e each of the four squares on the outer circle you know at the at the corner there's little squares inside the corner of each you know on the outer on the on the corners there's squares mm -hmm. and then there well there's eight eight main points you've got the four stars and the four squares each of those has its own template laid over that that's a medium sized template and the medium template has a sa is the same shape with a smaller template on each of its eight points ma the main eight points um now there's a lot of mystery still involved with this i don't know if each point on the template has its own smaller template or if it's just the main eight ones but i i know for a fact everything that that i know so far has treasure 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 locations lined up with it exactly uh the mile the the uh, distance like uh on the medium template the outer square would be 18.7 miles or roughly 19 miles out from from the center of the circle to where the square is, if that makes sense. I hope I'm explaining that correctly. The square inside each corner. And then the tip of each corner is 23 and a half miles from the center. And that's on the, the medium template. And it, I, I was trying to track down who, who was responsible for this. And I'm kind of going, I'm jumping around. Um, when I found out the template, you know, I laid it out, all these sites lined up with treasure locations and locations of historical interest, like mysteries, like the, the, the Newport Tower in Rhode Island and the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone, et cetera.
And I thought, okay, these, all of these sites predate the Knights of the Golden Circle. And, and how could they be responsible for doing this if every, a lot, most of the sites I found predate the Knights of the Golden Circle? So it, it also lined up with Victorio Peak, which is a famous treasure site in New Mexico. Um, and it, it supposedly had billions of dollars, and that was in the 19, late 1930s. Billions of dollars of gold found inside it, along with a numerous skeletons chained to a floor and to the floor in one of the caverns. But uh, that that one predated the Knights of the Golden Circle by centuries. So I started questioning the validity of the the validity of the Knights of the Golden Circle story, and I thought, okay, if they didn't do it, who did it? And as time went on, it seemed it, everything I found pointed more and more to Freemasonry. Uh, I started reading Albert Pike's book, for example, and Kabbalah. He mentions Kabbalah throughout his book, Gematria, and uh, different Kabbalistic terms and, and ideology of it. Um, he, uh, some, of, some of what he said, at first it didn't register, but a lot of the dimensions in these templates lined up with a lot of important numbers in Freemasonry and Kabbalah and Sufi mysticism and other other mystic beliefs and practices. And so I started going back through the Masons to Francis Bacon. I want it was kind of like I wanted to find out who was who was responsible for all of this. And so I just it was like kind of like doing genealogy, you know, following a family tree only with an organization. So I, I traced it back to the founding fathers, different Masons to Francis Bacon, and I thought, okay, this is a guy who did it. And I was satisfied for a day or two and realized that Francis, it went further back than Francis Bacon. Uh, his mentor was John D. John D. was a friend. You know, he had friends who were connected to people all throughout Europe, and you could easily make a tree linking them all, and not everybody involved, but I was trying to find a definite line of people with like minds or in the same organizations, which, which tied in with this. And it led me back through um, alchemists, Rosicrucians, Freemasons, Jewish rabbis, all the way to uh, uh, Rashi, a famous Jewish rabbi who was the favored court guest of the count, uh, one of the founders of the Knights Templar, um, Hugh, the Count of Champagne. And I thought, wow, you know, this is amazing. And I thought, okay, it sounds crazy, but it, it seems logical. Everything lines up. All the, all the, their belief systems, their, everything tied in with meanings that I'd found through the template and researching them helped me find, because I didn't only want to know who did it. I wanted to know why they, why that shape, why the dimensions. There, there's obviously some reason they made these certain dimensions and it, it was very intriguing to me and i uh, i'm now i'm starting to get ahead of myself and forget where i left off but oh, anyway well, oh go ahead oh i i had i thought okay people are going to think i'm crazy about this but it's it's what i found and this is how it you know i couldn't think of any other way it could fit and when i got um the uh, endorsement for my book from timothy hogan who's the grand master of the knights templar he came out and said that I had cracked part of the treasure, part of the code dealing with the treasures from Jerusalem that, that the Templar had got. That you discovering the scale of the map and its location was one of the breaks. Yeah, it was the big, yeah, the biggest break. Now, I'm just curious. So of the map that we're looking at, of the treasures you found, what points on the map are those treasures located? Well, all of the little circles, uh, if you, you know, the little dots, the black yeah. dots on the, on the inner and outer rings, uh, basically every spot on that, the squares in the circle, the center of it is another square. I just, I, I kind of blotted that out and made it transparent. So it made it easier to, to pinpoint a site when I overlaid it on Google earth. Well, but, so uh, where I'm going with this, just so mm -hmm. you know, and you could, so that you can answer the, however you want. Excuse me, I'm wondering if of the sites you identified, like the Kensington Ruin Stone is one of these points, correct? Yes. So 
of the point, so, are there any points on this map that's not identified? And I'm hearing someone's speaker feedback on us, just so you know. About I'm, that. It's, I don't it know. may be mine. I don't have a headset with me. So. Oh, okay. Um, but now, now it's oh, gone. Okay. Oh, um, nope. Okay. Now it's back. Sorry about that. Hold on just a second. Okay. So, yeah. So my question is, I'm wondering, depending on where the Kensington Ruin Stone is and where this other particular, uh, where where the points of origin, you know, origins are that definitely say the map is twisted in the correct direction and that these are those points. I'm wondering if this map, is it, I, I know it points to locations that are off America or is this strictly an American map? And what are potentially the other, like based on the scale of the map, you must know all the locations on this map. And I'm wondering if any of them, have you looked into any of them being incredibly odd or weird or incredibly Western? Like one of the points on this map, is it, you know, Montana or is it, you know what I mean? Is there? Yeah, I understand. Well, like the, the template itself lines up perfectly when I, Okay, the orientation of the template, it's not due north or magnetic north. It pointed towards, I believe, what uh, some, some refer to as the occult pole. It was the, uh, the North Star, um, not the North. It was the occult pole. They would find a location. They had, and that's a hard one for me to even describe. I, I know what I'm talking about when I say it, but when it comes to describing it, it's a little, a little tough. But several um and I've, i learned that from peter dawkins who's a, a rosicrucian in the uk just reading his his writings um he was he referred to it as the occult pole and i'd seen a few other people it was um it was almost like a different grid say, say you know when you look at a map and you have a grid system the longitude and latitude it's almost like the way they laid this out and this is just a theory it reminds me of an alternate grid system, like a secret map that you, you had, they had their own longitude and latitude is skewed from, from what everybody else would see on a map. If that yeah. makes sense. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, but yeah, it has points of origin that line up with the treasures you're speaking of. I'm wondering yeah, if it's, and it's, it's so many degrees counterclockwise from North the way it lines up the way where where i started i use that as my baseline i'm not sure exactly where where the map you know where the the first treasures in the americas were buried i would assume places like oak island would be good candidates but uh the way it skewed off of off of due north it matches up perfectly with the same 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 degrees off of north as um it was so many degrees west of north, and it was the same. It, it matches the uh, the Al the Al Aqsa Mosque, uh, the temp, you know the 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 Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem, and that amazed me. And the other another place it matches with was Mont oh, Castle del Monte, I believe. I can't. I can't. Yeah, that's an sure odd exactly. place, in, isn't it? it? Yeah, it's in Italy. And it's a very odd place. A lot of people suspect it was a Templar castle. And there's, you know, they're claiming that now. I, there's a lot of controversy over it. I'm not sure exactly why they built it, but there's there's alleged, there's a lot of mystery surrounding it. And a lot of people bring up occult mysteries, but I'm, I'm really, I haven't gotten too deep into to the, to that castle yet. So. What, uh, so again, I don't want to give away anything that's in the book or what you're not supposed to talk about, but I'm just curious if there was, as you laid the map out on the actual Google, as you're looking at it, was there any points on this map? Once you confirmed your suspicions, I'm just wondering if there were any points on the map that were besides the one, or were those the most surprising? Were those the most surprising locations or were there, is there something what? West or South that was like, well, how was that on the map? It, well, yeah, when it lined up with Victorio Peak and the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone, that just blew my mind because I knew those evident or items that were allegedly found in Victorio Peak predated, you know, the KGC. And the Los, the Los Lunas Decalogue Stone 
was allegedly created when the pioneer, some, some of the earliest settlers um, or, and explorers had asked the Native Americans who put the Hebrew writing on the stone, they, they didn't know. They said people who were here before us. And I thought, wow, I mean, and this template yeah. lines up with that. And that's, that really amazed me. Uh, that to me, that, that just blew my mind. Not, it's not just treasures. Yeah. It lines up with, with some very large treasures, but there, there's a lot more to it. There's, there's that map, I believe is a key to a lot of hidden history in the Americas, in well, Canada, Mexico, and the United States. Yeah. And I'm, I'm wondering now, I think maybe I have to ask the same question a different way. Are, is there any points on this map that had nothing at it? That had, oh, yeah. There, there are places. In, sorry about that. I don't mean to have the echo. Um, oh, it stopped for a while. So uh, I don't know what happened. Technology. But, you got to love it. Isn't it great? We <laughs> went to the moon and we can do everything on our phones, but we still can't. This and the same company that makes printers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's good for six yes. never work again yeah <laughs> it's i can't i can't what was the question you asked me a minute ago about uh, the, so uh, well it was the are there any points oh. on this map that mean nothing but they're unofficial points so i'm wondering not like yeah. x marks the spot and there's no hole but i'm wondering if there's still something at the nothing or what is the nothing it, there i've been to a lot of places and of course you know i think the reason they made this grid system one of the big advantages of that is that topography changes over the centuries over the decades i mean you can you can see a piece of land and one day and five years later it's, yeah. it's noticeably different so the grid system keeps that from it you don't have to look for a, a landmark to find the treasure or whatever you they've hidden you you just you go if you know yep. the grid system you know where you're at yeah um, the grid overlay and and it it reminds me of a city when you lay out a city it's in a, a grid sit you know you yep. lay out a grid you put your streets and there's vacant lots whereas on on this i i i like to liken it to a city compare it to a city it's just got a lot more vacant lots than than treasures but in places in the country, there's a lot of places around the country that seem like they're hot spots for this stuff. Not just treasures, but also, you know, historic mysteries. I, um, well, I don't think it can be understated I, that well, the grand uh, uh, mass, you know, your grandmaster, you know, pointing out that you actually solved something that people have been looking at for how many hundreds of years and you're responsible for actually discovering this. Yeah, I couldn't believe I couldn't believe it blew the whole thing blew my mind. Every time I think of even today, it just amazes me that every time what began as you know, just a, an old West outlaw and he was important on his own, but you know, in, in old West history, but I, I thought at most my great great grandfather was an outlaw and he may have buried a saddlebag worth, you know, with some coins and I'd be lucky to find it. And then I stole onto this. And it just, it's like you fell into a different dimension. It's, it's, it's just mind blowing. So Jesse would have had this in reference to the treasures he was trying to accumulate for restarting the war. Right. But then, right. well, but this, I don't think that's what Jesse's, I don't think Jesse was a part of Now, some people try to claim he was a treasurer of the Knights of the Golden Circle and they lump Albert Pike in with him and several other large, you know, well-known figures from that time but there's no proof and you know of course it was a secret society yeah. very secretive so that would be hard to prove but you'd think you know i don't know people seem dead certain that that's that's the truth and there's no proof so you know they're just going on a theory themselves um, and we do know he 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 didn't seem to you know, he, he was an outlaw and he went for a long time, but for years he had tried to fake his death so he could get out of it and live a peaceable life here in Texas. So uh, I, I don't see him doing it to fund a second civil war. And, uh, and from what you found, Teresa, that's this map and his relationship with the, with his part in it 
the map, do you think they just adapted it for, I don't know, the James gang as far as their association? I mean, do you think it was intentional that the Masons involved uh, Jesse James or no? Oh, personally, I do. I think it was intentional. Um, I feel like he was, again, you know, not just an outlaw. I felt like, I feel like it was intentional. It was for a higher purpose. They weren't just out robbing banks, you know, like just to rob banks. I felt like there, I feel like there was a higher purpose. I still don't know what that higher purpose is for sure, but I do feel like it was something more than just being a bank robber and robbing banks. Well, and we talked about that. You you made it really clear. I mean, the last few times we've talked that the banks that were identified were enemies of the South, the people who had interests and people forget they think it's all Federal Reserve related. It's not. I mean, they were targeting banks that were owned by financiers of the war against the South, basically. Correct? Right. So that it's not like he was just going after... I, again, you know, people have different levels of responsibility within a conflict. It seemed like this was a little bit of, as far as I think the Confederacy and Jesse James was concerned, this was a bit of the case of Robin Hood. It was, they were going to refund or at least go after people that were against the South. They weren't just choosing to stop at every bank they saw. Right, exactly. Uh, but this... And Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to mention, it's also been claimed, although there's, there's no proof, but some people had claimed in the past that when they robbed a gold shipment on a train, for example, the train coming from the West, heading back East with a shipment of gold would get robbed. They said the shipper, the, the, the one who, the people who owned the gold had it insured. So the gold would get stolen it was insured, so the, the owner never really lost anything. They got their money, and it was basically, some people claimed that they were involved with the owners of the gold that got robbed, and they were doubling their money. Oh, that seems sadly logical. It logic. seems a little far-fetched to me, but um, I do know <laughs> that well, not all of their targets were, were northern interests. It just seems like a lot of them were. And especially, you know, after the Civil War, it was the Reconstruction era. So, and, and, you know, I'm not trying to whitewash Jesse's name. He was, he was no angel, but I, I don't, I think there was, there may have been more to it than just, you know, Southern allegiances because when Jesse got involved, he, he never really seemed, he, he fought for Confederate guerrillas, but he never, it, with, the reason he got involved was just revenge against the people who attacked his family farm. Right. The, the map then has corresponding Masonic treasures and locations and Templar locations. And clearly the map's part of a bigger, bigger purpose. Again, don't want to get into it if it's in the book, but I will ask you, do you think that the uh, intent of, handing over this grid system was uh, of all the reasons. Is it that the Templars or the Masons in this case wanted to incorporate this particular treasure as part of a potential network? I mean, is it I, I, in the sense that here's an identifiable conflict and a reason as far as the players are concerned, you know, Jesse has his own reasons and maybe there's these financiers of these industrialists that are getting gold from the West or whatever the nefarious reasons are for the people in that time period. But is this actually the appropriation by a secret organization of an opportunity to take something that in its contemporary time was relevant to these, the, these causes, but in reality, the Mason's larger goal and picture was to collect this treasure for some other purpose that, again, they, they were not aware of. That makes sense to me. The way it's laid out isn't just, and, and this is just one part of the template. Uh, the other, you know, there was a large, medium, and small, the veil template, but the veil template I found later 
ties in with a larger template that's more, um, I guess, sacred of na in nature. Um, it's the, in the shape of the Kabbalistic tree of life. And it stretches from Williamsburg, Virginia to Victoria Peak, New Mexico in, in length. And from a, it's, it's several hundred miles wide in width. Oh. I mean, it is. Oh yeah. That, that I was, photo uh, I was going to go to that tree, uh, that okay. other photo. If that's wait, Nope. That one or back. No, it was, it was the one with the yellow. There we go. Um, yeah, that, that's the Kabbalistic tree of life. Uh, one of the shapes It's the most common shape you find and uh, the path going down it, the way it's laid out on the on the template the the top the top portion is you know the the it's it's uh keter or keether it's also in in english it's crown and uh but it, that would be located in williamsburg virginia at the bruton parish church and that wasn't found by me that treasure location was found by a manly palmer hall's wife marie bauer hall who both are since passed but uh, Manly Palmer Hall was a, a famous 33rd degree Mason author and lecturer. Um, some people refer to him as the father of new age thinking, um, uh, modern new age thinking. And, and uh, his wife had found, she had decrypted ciphers and code she'd found in the, the writings of Shakespeare and also in um, um, anagrams in, in a cemetery in Bruton Parish Church in, in Williamsburg, Virginia, the colonial part of Williamsburg. And, and people laughed at her and mocked her. She said she knew where the original church foundations were and nobody believed her and she proved them further to state that there was a, a vault beneath the, the churchyard that was 22 feet deep and it contained treasures of historic importance that would shake the foundations of, of the world, um, you know, of history anyway. And, and she said it wasn't just uh, uh, like precious stones and gold and things like that. It was, it was knowledge and information that would change what we know of as world history. And the bottom part of it is, it stands for kingdom or uh, kingdom or earth. Uh, that, that lines up there, that would be on the map, Victoria Peak, New Mexico, near White Sands Missile Range. I think it's always fascinating that I think people should, for all the words of conspiracy and the ways to deflect us having an interest or taking these things seriously, I find it interesting that more and more, I, I always thought that no matter where the location was, uh, t two things about military. One is they only pick locations that were absolutely strategic to the latest military situation. But then in reality, I feel like they were picking places that also helped hide some maybe mm, potential archaeological sites that were relevant to them wanting to find, whether it's contemporary as in a Templar treasure or it was congruent with an ancient find, like the stuff that I talk about in yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I think it ties in. Right, Teresa? It's just it's not... so many layers to it. <laughs> yeah, and, and the scary part is I don't think... Here's the other layer is that we have modern military picking for what they think are strategic locations for missile and the technologies and wave and frequencies and scalar technologies and whatever else they haven't told us they've had for 100 years. But then it's also interesting in that, okay, maybe they picked the sites because they know that they were ancient high-tech sites that are relevant to dig up that they find things at but the other layer is i think what's even doubly or scary is the fact that these sites were used for the maybe the same purposes by a more ancient society that's the part yeah. that's really scary is that if you have a global population in ancient truly like pre-younger driest times yeah. and they are highly advanced and they were using the same locations for military purposes because it made sense globally. And I've yeah. always wondered, I've always wondered that about all the different various, I mean, it, it can't just be coincidence that you have, actually, I should ask you that, uh, how many of these treasures line up to military bases? There's a few, but not too many. Most of them. I think they're unrelated, most of them but don't. Yeah. But I think 
they're not related because they're too contemporary. And, I, it yeah. may, that's a good question, but it, it, even, even if it's not on a military base, it would be very easy to protect or guard yeah. any, any, any group. I mean, all they would have to do is purchase the property around it and just not allow access. You just yeah. sit on it. Yeah, just yeah. sit on it. Uh, so, yeah, so the lowest point, here you are. And you said you've been to some of these locations, right? Did you just start wanting to check them out physically? Yeah. One, one of the sites uh, that we were shown that Wagner Carr had his driver show us was, uh, was part of the the tree of life template and it also matched up with the veil template uh, and and just to explain that with uh in cabalistic belief there are three veils of negative existence and that's i thought that was interesting because there's three sizes on the veil template uh large medium and small but and it goes further it even ties in with alchemical beliefs uh uh, Fulcanelli, who wrote the mystery of the cathedrals, he described the crisscross pattern of the veil and that, how they used that in pulling the um, the gold, using mercury to pull the gold from the stone. And they oh, they get real, just it's full of symbolism. I mean, you could go, you could talk for hours just on the alchemical symbolism behind a lot of this. But uh, I think a lot of times the alchemical symbolism. It, it was used by alchemists, but I also think they used it to transmit coded messages. It's so, is that in the book, by the way? Yes, yes. Yeah, there we go, folks. There's stuff in the book. Another Read interesting thing, and this was just of interest, great interest to me. Uh, there's a male and female side. On the Tree of Life, you have three main columns. There's a center column, which is the longest. And then there's, you know, two main, co two, two outer columns. Well, one, one of the columns is male, the other's female. And at the, at the, the top two outer columns, not, not on the center, but the, you know, you've got the center one and then you've got the two uppermost on the left and right hand side. Those yep. align with, with cities. One is Columbus and the other is Columbia City. And I thought that was really, it, it lined up with the male and female aspects of the tree of life. And it just really made me wonder if that wasn't done on purpose. It just seemed too, too much yeah. of a coincidence. Well, I, and I, I do know Scott Walter and some of the, uh, that this whole, uh, the Masonic uh, ideas that, you know, clearly were prevalent, whether it's, you know, a Francis key or, Ben Franklin or Jefferson or, I mean, clearly, you know, National Treasure didn't write itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, right? <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. So this, sorry, inside joke for the three of us. Uh, but this tree of life, though, was this something you found as you started digging into that other map? Or did you find this first and the, the, the maps kind of came together I mean, you had the map from the family origin, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but then where, where did this fall in? Where did you end up with the tree? This came later. Um, I started because I knew it. I was just playing around on the map. And, I, you know, as I'd read and learned more and started getting, I read Morals and Dogma from Albert Pike and all the Kabbalistic texts in there. Or, you know, the, he, he mentioned Kabbalah a lot throughout the book. And then several other authors, Masonic authors and others who had mentioned the Kabbalah and it seemed to tie in with all of this. And I just started, I, I, it, it's hard to, it's really hard to describe. It can't, it didn't come overnight, but over time I started piecing things together. And then one day I just drew lines from one point to another and there it was tree of life. And I thought this, this is, it, it was just weird. <laughs> it's hard yeah. to explain the feeling. It felt, uh, it, you know, you have to question yourself. And then I would question myself. I thought, okay, have I had enough sleep? Yes. You know, I'd make sure I, I'd go through this checklist to make sure I wasn't, you know, just trying to fit something in that wasn't there. And uh, it, it, I, as far as I know, I, th there's no chance of that. It just, I stumbled on it and it was amazing to me. Well, so. Teresa, uh, yeah, at what point, Teresa, did he bounce this stuff off of you so that he could check if he was crazy? 
<laughs> well, we, so we always, like when we first started the research with my mother, um, there were little rabbit holes throughout the research that kind of led us down this path. So it was always kind of lingering there. You know, we always kind of had the knowledge of it. And then Danny um, went with that and just kind of dug a little deeper. And so it, it wasn't too crazy sounding because we, it was always kind of lingering in the background. Right. The maps uh, are there. Is, the Yeah. And like in his journal, he has little symbols um, in the, in his journal that he wrote. Oh, really? Um, yeah. That kind of correspond with all of Danny's research. So it wasn't too crazy because it was always kind of there and he just kind of dug a little deeper, got a little bit more involved in it. So you know, this is, know. Oh, go ahead. But yeah, I mean, he had a lot of symbols in his journal and often I, I would love to find out kind of like national treasure, like in the maps, there's hidden symbols within the maps. Right. I would like to see if there's any hidden symbols in his journal like that. But I have no idea where you could go to find that information out. So I, can I don't think, know. I can think of a couple Masonic lodges in their libraries. Huh? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I need to go to those uh, libraries. I, I mean, this isn't something you would publish or put out for people to look at, right? This is something you need to look at on your own first. Yeah. 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 I mean, I would have no problem with revealing it if it was there, but. No, it seems like something that, uh, well, no, it's just really interesting because those symbols, they could be anything and it's fun to do the adventure and the sleuthing on your own. I mean, that's the part of the fun of discovery and oh, yeah. go going on the adventure. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, I'm sorry. Was there something else? I guess we interrupted. We digress. I, I was. Uh, no, no, I just, um, I, you know, there, he was, I don't think that he was crazy at all when he he approached me with it he had this journal his own journal that he took yeah. notes on and um he he let me read it and it, at first i was like wow it was really i mean it went <laughs> deep but you know when it sunk in it made sense so yeah no he went crazy so wait, wait I, I so oh go ahead yeah no it's just I think it, it corresponded with some of the earlier research with the, the symbols, so. Well, and you stated your mom was the resistance in your mom's time period for writing this book was quite high. Do you, and I guess, you know, you've t you mentioned it a little bit, but do you think that the symbols in his journal, do you feel like this ties even more into the Jesse James story to begin with and really confirms identity? Or do you think it's just adds verification to the complexity of who he was? I, yeah, I think it definitely adds above. to the complexity. Yeah, all of the above. <laughs> Way to so ask many... a leading question. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but There's just yeah. so many layers story it just keeps going it's crazy and yeah fascinating it, it is because I, I i i found in researching historical fiction and history itself because it's not just you know a lot of people hear me do interviews and it's like okay yeah i spent three and a half years of research and then i spent six months editing and it wasn't just editing it was adding new information but in the process of doing that or in the past i've I've worked on um, other historical fiction that actually involves the civil war. And the truth is so much stranger than fiction when you get into the details and you're like, how is there not already a movie about some of this? Yeah. You know, yeah. it, 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 it's so yeah. bizarre. You, you would never sit down and say, well, here's where the story is going to go. Uh, yeah. A bunch of cowboy slash uh, uh, Wild West gang is going to turn nice. into secret Masonic Knights Templar treasure hunt. Yeah. <laughs> Collect them all. Uh, yeah. So it leads into even more like, yeah, it's just, yeah, where would you begin? <laughs> There's so many layers to it. 
No, I mean, if you're playing with a Jesse James toy, does it come with a cowboy hat and a horse, or does it come with a Indiana Jones whip and a yeah. lost right. Ark of the Covenant? Yeah. It, so, so I am so sorry. So, not digressing further, but here we are on this um, road. How much time? At, you said the suspicion was there all along. You had the map. How soon after the first book did you start looking into the Templar connection or was it kind of happening all along? That, well, oh, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, when I, I, I didn't, I, I had no clue that it would lead to the Templar, but you know, as, as I just kept reading back and, and going, trying to research who, try, I wanted to know who was responsible for this. It was amazing. It was you know, it predated Jesse, it predated America, it, you know, yeah. and it was, yeah. or the United States, Canada, and Mexico. It was just, it, it blew my mind. I thought, who could have done this? If it predated our, you know, our Western history, then who, who did it? And, or does Western history go back much further than, than what we believed? And that's what it led me to think. I mean, I, I, cause some of these I do believe were put here long before the United States was founded. Well, you got to uh, wonder if those organizations uh, were doing that around the world. Yeah. And see, that's a good, good what you just mentioned. Uh, I, I, I was, I'm curious to know if the template also works in Europe. Oh, it, it has to. Well, one of the things I was looking at with the original grid system, I, I thought it might've been self-evident, but would that grid system have within it the grid system, like a zip file, when you compact a large file of information, is that grid something that is supposed to be unfolded on itself to really blanket the whole world with the identical grid? So if you find the one treasure, like if you find four treasures in, or, or five to put that treasure map in the correct locations and at scale, do you then unfold an identical, like an origami? Do you unfold, yeah. do you know what I mean? Like on the yeah. corner, on the top, does that I've wondered, map actually? Yeah, and, I've and, wondered the same thing. Does, does it cover the whole globe? Right. So it's not a matter that you just found like three or four locations or that there was nothing there. It's that no matter what, if you were to lose the map, the identical map grid system would be for every location you know, it'd be the the whole world's been mapped for, is it treasure worthy or not location? Or is it a, uh, like a ruin stone? Is it a, you know, map this here, map that there, you know, is it, how is it relevant? You know, but is it, but it's on that system. So I'm wondering yeah. if that's how the grid system relays itself is that sometimes it's a lookout or um, like the Rhode Island tower uh, is it, you know, is it just not just doing star constellation slash it's a, it's clearly a, a marker that then the next marker isn't a uh, ruin stone, but it's a treasure. But I'm wondering if they just repeated that grid. I don't know. Did you ever, uh, I, that's a dumb question. I don't know why I didn't ask that. Have they, it, I don't know, has that been something that from a Masonic standpoint, is that something you could ask or was it revealed already or no? It hadn't, yeah, I, I, I don't see why I couldn't ask, but uh, from, hmm, that's Episode a good question. Three. I haven't really gone, I have I know that Timothy Hogan knows, knows that I've found, according to him, I cracked part of the code. So there's much more to it. Well, it makes uh, me what? wonder if it's just <laughs> not an entire global system then, and, and it's a repeatable, uh, I would yeah. too. And, you know, and if you look, like I'd mentioned the, uh, the veil template, it matches, it matches the layout of, of, uh, uh, the dome of the rock and also the, the castle in what was that castle del Monte in Italy. Yeah. I can't remember what part of Italy, but, but yeah, it, it matches those, even the, the, uh, their, the way it's laid out, you know, 
it, the compass directions, I, I'm, I'm at a loss for words for some reason. I do that lately. So I've been trying glass. to fix our well. And yeah. <laughs> no, you know what part of, part of it is? It's the uh, constant, because uh, we're doing, I think for those listening, something that we do, I think all the time as researchers, it's we're revisiting a, literally a, a mind, um, a total mind castle to steal from Sherlock Holmes of information we've stored and if we get something yep. interesting enough to us yeah we're we're refiling and re like we can't help but process it real time like we're not going to think yep. about it later so we're busy like we're live we're trying to do an informative interesting and entertaining um and for those other researchers out there, self-experimenters to give you guys something to really like go after. But at the same time, in real time, I think you just witnessed a, uh, you trying to process something that would actually take more time than we have on the call. But it's crazy, isn't it? It is. Yeah. But no regrets. It's definitely a it's lot of fun. So yeah, so you're... So you're right there too, Teresa, like trying to work this out, right? Like, what does this grid look like? How many other places line up? Is the Masonic yeah. grid more accurate than the ley line grid? You know, like everyone knows about ley lines. Where do the ley lines fall yeah. on the, like, is there an echoing of all these technologies falling on top of each other? So I'm wondering what right. a worldwide grid of this map system looks like against the ley lines and against other sacred sites and how much of it is a contemporary contrivance, uh, still valid, but I wonder how much of it overlays with megalithic culture or, you know, like beyond medieval or uh, dark ages or Roman or Greek. I'm wondering what was all borrowed or kept alive in research that made this exactly map system. Down. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. readapted, just reused. Yeah. yeah. And, completely and, and so then it's like we're gonna go look for t so just like i'm uh, our family history is jesse james and then there's this okay. templar thing lurking and then you get the map system and then the map system is something that's yeah. masonic and templar related but is their association with that map really the lingering connection to a more ancient um map and or land um identifying system and again it's not just what's above water it's like if it goes back even older, it's like how many sites are underwater yeah. that relate to that map? Exactly. And, and is it a better starting point to uh, see if there's enough coincidences on worldwide gridding this map, then I wonder if, because um, they've been able to do that with giant stone circles that nobody ever talks about across like uh, Norway, Sweden. There are massive stone circle systems that align with mainland Europe uh, but it's, it, it's weird things like that where, you know, over and over people will talk about Stonehenge as a standalone amazing thing, but there's henges yeah. all over the world and there's some in Libya yeah. that no one's going to go to right now. And that's even way more impressive as far yeah. as it's, you know, it's, it's detailed, but anyway, they're in line. There's all these, uh, when you get to a certain age group. Of dots. Yeah. It's like connecting the dots. Yep. That's what we and, should in the book. And, and, it even connects to, so, I mean, it's, there's this, it's like layers and layers once you connect those dots, where, where will yep. they lead to? And sometimes yep. it gets a little overwhelming. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then this, but it's and, fun. yeah. And I, I want to check in with you guys. I know it's close to eight. Are you guys good? Uh, I know we started later. Are you guys good going for about another half hour? Yeah. Oh, I could yeah, go I, all night with this. I love it. Oh, great. So at once we, you know, imagine if we were doing this live and uh, people could go out and start Googling and laying the map over for us. <laughs> um, that would be, nice be awesome. To get. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so, all right. So we got a very interesting map system that's overlapping on itself. I'm wondering, right. you said you had another interpretive. Is this a good or a bad time to bring up that you had an interpretive drawing for the tree of life? Do you want to talk about that? The interpreted drawing for the tree of life. Oh, you oh. said it. Yeah, you said it was. I think uh, oh, this mean, one. Uh, oh, yeah, that was. Well, th the funny thing, in my opinion, and I've, I've detailed it more in the book, but the uh, 
the veil template, th this is part of one cell of the veil template. And I just, I, I, um, I took the, the original, you know, rough template and I was uh, trying to decipher the symbols in each one and each one yeah. has meaning. And like, um, well, I just put the Templar coins around it just because Templar tie in with it, but Rosicrucians, Masons, you can see the square, the compass, the square encompasses, um, the floor to Lee, the floor to Lee was an ancient tree of life. The, what, what people called the turkey tracks or bird tracks on the rough template were, were actually a representation of the tree of life, which ties all the way back. It goes further back than the, uh, um, the Hebrew, the Jewish religion. It goes all the way to, to uh, Egypt and maybe beyond that. But I traced it as far back as Egypt. There were, there were, was a symbol the Egyptians used that, you know, that ties in with, that's where the floor de lee came from. And it's all basically, a sim, it's symbolic. The floor de lee is basically a representation of the tree of life. I'm trying to, I'm, I'm rambling about that now. I'm trying to keep it short and sweet and there's so much more behind it. <laughs> but, well, in, in reference to what we're talking about, it's, it's fascinating because I always, even as a kid, the patterns and the clothing and it's like, well, it's ornate. And I never believed that. Mm -hmm. I looked at those crazy paisleys and incredibly ornate Corinthian columns. And I'm like, there's got to be a reason for the complexity. Yeah. And to me, it's always, I think, technology that could only be remembered by leaving it in print uh, as a so. pattern. What went from... Uh, you know, I, we can't record this wave frequency anymore turned into the symbol for ohm. You know, when they finally got back into cymatics and they put dust on a plate and they vibrate it. And when you do the frequency for, you know, ohm, it looks just like the symbol that's been known for thousands of years. How would they know that? How, yes, exactly. You know, yeah. Right. And, and, and it gets left in a textile because the machines that would remember what it meant are gone. And they're like, well, we got to remember this until we can get those machines going again. And then it turns into a textile. It turns into a secret society symbol. And before you know it, there's a, a machining or a complexity to these symbols that don't directly relate to either a contemporary, you know, they've made contemporary stories, but that's just not, why this design is so ornate yeah 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 and it well yeah and, and the i'm trying to the the template itself the just each sail has it's it's a map of the earth the universe it ties in the the dimensions the dimensions uh, the scale of the template it ties in with you know um, well the celestial body the earth you know um God, I'm trying to not get, it's, you start getting into that. It's like too many rabbit holes in one sentence, but, but <laughs> there's, um, you know, it, it ties in with, with everything, the universe, the earth, uh, the tree of life, their different belief systems, different mysticisms. And it ties in beautifully, in my opinion, and may, I'm probably biased just because all the discoveries I made with it, but it's just, it's beautiful. And yeah. just the symbolism behind it and the meanings behind every part. I mean, it ties in with planets uh, yeah. um, and, and goes back to myth, mythology, mythology. Um, one of, uh, one of the, uh, if you're familiar with Et and Arcadia Ego, the famous painting by Nicholas Poussin, it was in, it was highlighted, I believe in, uh, well, in Holy Blood, Holy Grail by, by Lincoln, I can't remember all three are, uh, authors' names for some reason. They're slipping my mind. I have not seen that. Yeah, uh, maybe uh, I've seen it and I don't know. But okay, I, I can't tell you offhand that I know of it. Well, it surrounds the treasures of Ren Le Chateau in France uh, at an Arcadia Ego. A lot of people believe that's pointing to the treasures near Ren Le Chateau, which tie in uh, Berenger Saunier. Uh, the uh, parts of that were in the Da Vinci Code movie. Um, Okay. He, he hinted at a lot of it and he, in some of the names he, he, he used, but, um, the, if you ever get a chance to read Holy Blood, Holy Grail, I think this story 
the template, the veil template, the tree of life is a continuation of those treasures, which came allegedly from the Templar. Uh, they, it, it's, it's fascinating. You know, the Templar were raided by the Catholic church. Uh, bef- there were 13 ships in the po- in a port in France and they were ready to, the Catholics were ready to grab that. You know, the church was ready to grab that. And when they got there, the, all the ships were gone in the middle of the night, they just slipped out and uh, all the coffers, they expected to find full coffers in the Templar stronghold and there, it was empty. And they, so they got rid of the treasure. Where did they take it? A lot of people say they took it overseas, but they also left a lot of it in France. And there's supposedly holy relics around Rennes Le Chateau. Um, but to make a long story short, I think this ties in directly is a continuation of that story. That's so interesting there. And, and again, it seems like a way to protect yourself as a multi-generational secret society would be to maintain a template system that at the highest, highest levels, you would be able to lay this grid down and there's going to be either a monument, a directional informational stone or a treasure, depending on the point in the grid and the time. So maybe one of the relevance is uh, the time frame, like within this hundred years, you know, look to this area or, or to this star, or you know, it could it could be, uh, you know, that could be part of it. Is well, yeah. under this star at this location, this and this point in the grid is relevant to our ongoing human story. You know, like a uh, uh, center of conflict was this, these locations in Europe, there was not conflict in America. So maybe there's a reason uh, the certain stars or points were more relevant because they needed people to somehow they needed the Mason, the Masons need to be able to explain, you need to look at the grid, but you need to look in this new country. Or this yeah, new area. That that's what I was getting at. I'm glad you said that. It jogged my memory on the um, oh, with Ren Le Chateau and the Nicholas Poussin painting. It's called a you know well the named Et in Arcadia Ego. It shows three shepherds and a lady uh, knelt down. Some of them are kneeling next to a tomb and they're pointing at a at a spot on the tomb, almost as if. And I detail it in my book, but I believe. The uh, I believe it points to the constellation Lyra on Cassini's celestial globe of 1792, and uh, at that and on that globe, according to that globe, it it was um, Lyra at the time was over the heartland of America, and I think that was a big there key. We go. And, yeah, I, and and I also show how you know, a lot of people say Arcadia was in Greece. Well, yes, it was. And then they say it moved to France. And well, I think it did. And I think it also moved parts of America were known of, known as Arcadia, I mean, a large part of America from Florida all the way up to close to Nova Scotia. Who, who uh, why was that painting originally commissioned? Do you know? I don't know why it was commissioned. I can't remember why. I know I've read it, and I can't recall. Um, well, Dale, I, I, I wasn't – sorry, I wasn't – I wouldn't think you would – I mean, I, I don't know. Hussein I was trying to... had, had admitted to, to uh, painting, basically passing on secret knowledge in his paintings uh, for those in the know. Yeah, and the, it, it seems like it's been a, a, a modus operandi for many artists – that, I agree. that may have been what has supported a number of artists throughout history is to, and then their art, uh, like why doesn't it always bug everyone? Like why does some art get popular and some doesn't? And yeah. granted, there's some bad crap, like a uh, rotten, rotten banana peel, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> which was a thing, but uh, you know, or Andy Warhol. I mean, there's things that just get trendy depending on the drugs of choice. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's art. Uh, but then, <laughs> but then on the other hand, it seems like you know you take a fairly talented, successful, at least their skills, and say, well, we'd like you to commission this wealthy family. I'd like you to commission this and that. And then, you know, you get it doesn't. How hard would it be to really take a couple of people and a couple of curators and 
a collegiate system and say, well, this, this artist is valuable and now we're going to teach his history and this is going to be hung in this museum. And uh, we're going to try to reinforce in a public way, the security of the, of the picture by keeping it in that public eye as a gift of the ages of art. When in reality, it's for the people in the know, it's, you know, your map is safe or at least your origin point is, or, you know, yeah. it's, I, I don't, it just seems very logical now. And like you said, they're using the constellations to say, okay, here's our, yeah, yeah. It, this is too fun, right? Oh, I um, love it. I it is. I love it. This is, and, and who would have thought that we'd be doing like, and again, theoretical there, it's not like there's a, a significant amount of treasures. I, I, I go on about a city that's off of the uh, west side of Cuba that is underwater and it's you know, 2,300 feet deep. And the last time it could have been above water was, 20, was at 2,300 feet deep, even with plate, plates shifting and tectonic movements, it, it would have been a minimum of 50,000 years ago that this pyramid city would have been above water. And the map of the world would look very different at yeah. 55 or 60,000 years ago. So you got to think maybe the younger Dryas, I only bring it up because there's a world, you know, you have this society, you have these maps like the P. Reese Reese map. Yeah. That's yeah. all. I was just going to bring that up really. I guess I could just jump to it, which is here you have the unfettered coastline of Antarctica with um, clearly what could have been uh, not above ice, you know, Antarctica would have had no ice on it and it would have been at least 8,000 years ago. So why is Admiral Reese from Turkey in possession of ancient Sea King maps that are showing world travel like the Phoenicians and Canaanites going to America? Why are we in possession of maps that are showing travel to Antarctica with no no ice? And, That's true. And, and therein lies our our worldwide snapshot of uh, how do you constantly perpetuate it, it? The very secret, it seems like for somebody who's really smart and into cryptography that making maps like this would make sense once you're into keeping secrets and you know some other mm -hmm. systems to keep secrets. But on the other hand, it in itself seems to be a passed down uh, system because someone for a very long time has known that places sink places get frozen, places disappear under the water. Yeah. And you need a yeah. map system that, again, it seems to constantly have multiple points of origin. You have a star system, you have a time frame or a date, and you can incorporate yeah. it if you grid out the planet. But like, who did it first? And why do they know? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> well, and that's true. So, yeah, and how did they know to look so far and that so in, into the future with, with that that it would still pertain and be relevant to to our time right now? Well, the Catholic Church, so yeah, yeah, no, I think you're right. I think it goes back to that Catholic Church chasing down the Templars because the Templars were going to reveal things about the Church that they did not want known. You know, yep. that's that's a problem. It's pro. So the, you know, on one hand, you know, like in the hooked X, the uh, Scott Walter points out uh, that it's the whole uh, idea of Mary Magdalene and Jesus being married and John the Baptist being with Mary Magdalene prior and them having a child. And right. the, that, that there's all this lineage issues that the Masons were high, or that the Templars and then the Masons know. But I'm wondering if it's even more complex because uh, as we know, the story of the church is very uh, creative. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. when you're the largest and most powerful organization on earth that spans kingdoms and boundaries of no country is, I mean, it's unfettered. Oh, yeah. it, and, and so it's had such a hand in human history, uh, modern, our modern human history. It, you know, if the, you, you couldn't handle it with an entirely weaponized independent border crossing night system like the Templars and allow that to function if they were not fully under your control, I would think it would be an incredibly dangerous organization. Yes. Uh, if you're maintaining that, one. Oh, yeah. go ahead. What was that, and Teresa? Yeah. 
Well, I just, I mean, that's why, you know, where um, they did have to kind of, they were kind of forced to go secret and with, and, you know, coded messages for their, to save their lives, I think. Yeah. I mean, so it was dangerous. Yeah. And I, you know, it's here you are. And this, this, this is just some of it. Is there, I don't want to ruin any future books, but have you discussed the, has the treasures and the locations on the map so far pointed you in any new directions that you haven't written about yet? Yes. What, what, yeah. Whether with Jesse or with something else. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell a little bit of it. There, one of the biggest clues was in Jesse's, <laughs> after finding out, you know, everything I found out looking for the treasures and then revisiting, uh, well, I tied that in with some of the information that was in Jesse's diary. Uh, he mentioned in his diary when he and the gang rode to Shreveport, Louisiana, they took a train to Shreveport, hopped a steamship, and went south on the river to uh, Natchitoches, Louisiana. I think it was, yeah, to Natchitoches. And then they hopped over on the, well, they, they, get, they got into Louisiana when they got off the ship and rode back north, the opposite the direction they just traveled. And they stopped at a man's house named Gervais Fontenot. And Gervais Fontenot, I wanted to know who he was. So I started you know, I'm researching him, his genealogy, anything I could find. And I found out he was the nephew of Jean Lafitte, the note, you know, some called him a pirate, some said a privateer, I guess, you know, it depended on what side he was fighting for and who he, he, he liked stealing. Uh, he liked catching Spanish ships. And, and because he, he and, and according to Jean Lafitte, the reason he did that was because his grandmother was, he called her a Jewess and she had suffered during the inquisition so he wanted to make spain and the catholic church pay and he hit any ships that were controlled by Cath you know the catholic church so uh, but the thing is a lot of templar were said to have been pirates um there were a lot of according to some authors a lot of jewish pirates in the caribbean in fact there's a book uh, that i really liked it was a uh, jewish pirates of the caribbean was the title and, and uh, he highlighted how a lot of jewish people were trying to escape the inquisition and the harsh times in europe and and they they came to the new world looking for you know better times but when it came to jean lafitte being jesse and his gang stayed at jean lafitte's nephew's house and this this was after jean lafitte had passed away but um it, it highlighted to me a possible connection with you know a bigger connection kind of you know pirates and outlaws and they were all basically the same same thing just in different areas so uh you know one was on the water one was on the land but they that that tied in with a potential network and i knew jesse under his alias was a freemason well i found out when researching jean lafitte when he'd helped the U.S. win, you know, beat the English in New Orleans, uh, beforehand, he had had Masonic communications with Andrew Jackson. And I, you can't have Masonic communications unless both parties are Masons. So that, that suggests strongly that Jean Lafitte was a Mason. And it, it just ties back into Masonic connections. some reason I can't hear I think it went muted I can't hear either I can hear now but I can't hear Jared I, I can't either I'm gonna text him <laughs> 